Welcome everyone. I'm delighted to introduce this seminar celebrating 10 years of one of the BBC's most popular and celebrated dramas of all time called The Midwife. Heidi Thomas's unique and unstoppable series inspired by the memoir of Jennifer Worth. From day one, Call the, Midlife, Call the Midwife was a huge hit with the viewing public, launching to weekly audiences of over 10 million. But who could have imagined as that first series launched in 2012, that 10 years later, Call the Midwife would, be, would continue to, to be the jewel in the BBC's crown and still unimpeachably popular with audiences. On Christmas day of last year, Call the Midwife was the most watched programme across all channels proof that the nurses and nuns of Nanatus are still going strong. We are delighted and grateful to all involved that as we launch series 10, that series 11 is already underway. Over the last decade, the series has thoughtfully explored some amazing and powerful subjects, and this new series is no different. There are some interesting changes in store too for the residents of Nanatus House. Trixie faces a new professional challenge Sister Monica Joan must overcome a crisis of faith following her devastating fall at Christmas. And of course, we're in 1966, the year in which England will win the World Cup. I'd like to thank the wonderful cast and crew for a truly exceptional series. And of course, I must pay special tribute this year to the work of three wonderful women who guided the series with such strength and wisdom over the past decade. They need no introduction. Heidi Thomas, Annie Tricklebank and Pippa Harris, we thank and salute you. Lastly, I hope you'll enjoy the panel today, which is hosted by Erica Wagner, who is, joined, who is joined by Heidi and cast members Helen George, Jenny Agatha and Leonie Elliott. Over to you, Erica. Thank you so much, um, Piers, and it's really wonderful to be here and I'm going to say my words of praise too uh, about Call the Midwife. Um, how to introduce a discussion of Call the Midwife. I don't need to tell any of you how much this show has become a part of our cultural and emotional landscape. Since it first came to our screens in 2012, over the course of these 10 brilliant seasons, the beautiful radical drama has involved millions of viewers in, I believe, over a hundred countries around the world in the lives of the nuns and midwives of Nanatus House and in the lives of the London community that they serve. We've called this event Comfort and Challenge because while the show is rightly seen as offering comfort in its depiction of the warm bonds of human relationships of every stripe, it has never shied away from confronting the challenges of those relationships and the issues that face the popular community and all of us. From alcoholism to domestic abuse, from the true cost of poverty to the politics of birth control and abortion, Call of the Midwife has never turned away from any human difficulty or dilemma. In doing so, in doing so it shows us that we too can face our challenges and our fears with grace and with love. A little while ago, Heidi Thomas, the show's creator and one of our wonderful guests this afternoon, said to me, I genuinely do believe, and this is my philosophy as a person, that everybody alive is of value and it is our obligation as human beings to find out where other people's value is positioned. That's as good a mission statement for Call the Midwife as any, I think. And I'm so excited to be here to celebrate the show's 10th anniversary with her here today, as well as welcoming the great Jenny Agater, our beloved sister Julianne, brilliant Helen George, who is the courageous and compassionate Trixie, and the marvelous Leonie Elliott, who has made nurse Lucille Anderson such a vital part of our lives. And if we were all live now, of course, and in a room together, there would be a huge round of applause, but I think we have a, a virtual round of applause going. So, um, so welcome, welcome all of you. Um, and I'd like to start our conversation um, really um, coming back to basics and asking you each briefly what you think makes Call the Midwife so special and 
and what has really made it special to you? Now, Heidi, I'm going to turn to you first as the show's creator. So in a sense, we maybe know um, why it's why it's special to you, but but do do enlighten us further. I think the reason it's become so precious to me over the years, and it has been 10 years as we're all here to reflect upon, is somehow I never run out of stories to tell. I never run out of inspiration. And I think what we as a team have managed to achieve over the years is to give people, <clears throat> excuse me, to give people the comfort of familiarity without that ever becoming stale. I think I derive enormous pleasure from the complexity of the performances uh, you know, we get from our main players, three of whom are here today. Um, I'm constantly finding new little corners and nuances, um, points of illumination in their characters. That's partly because of what they bring to the table. And I also think the world in which we are set is full of nuance and complexity and points of illumination. I never, ever get bored of it. And I can't think that for me, there will ever be another job like this. Thank you so much, Heidi um, and Jenny. And of course, Jenny um, and Helen, you've you've both been there um, from from the very beginning. Um, so maybe you can also talk a little bit about the that trajectory. Jenny, can you tell us a bit about your feelings? Well, I have to say, first of all, um, I'm so glad that Heidi feels that there are, there are always going to be points of illuminations and, and um, inspiration for stories, because it is actually um, above all, I think, the stories that that actually hold people. But it's the stories because they belong in uh, you know, some time ago where one can look at social values and people and the way we are. And Heidi always finds some extraordinary way of seeing how that relates to the modern day. So all of those stories actually are things that we're still affected by one way or another. Um, I must say every year I've always, I've waited for those scripts to come in and I keep waiting and, and looking and then wondering if they're going to be, if there's going to be a, a slip. I shouldn't say this, well, it's not going to be so good, but there's always this wonderful revelation and they are always um, full of complexity and full of the human spirit and, and all of those things that make them an absolute joy to read and a joy to perform and a joy to watch everybody else take part in. And we have babies as well, which um, add to, to the enjoyment of life. I think. That, I think that they, they always provide that feeling of um, babies always bring with them hope. Um, you're always looking to a future and hoping that we somehow will make things better for the future. And yet we live with the day and the problems that we have. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, Leonie, you joined, and I think you've, you've been with us. I now feel so involved, I say us. Um, a series seven, I think you, I think you joined. Um, so maybe tell us a bit about your experience. I mean, it's always nerve wracking joining an established show. And I knew already how popular Call the Midwife was before I joined. So that was nerve wracking to join, but everyone was so friendly and Heidi created such a wonderful character, like Jenny said, with nuances and complexities and it was really exciting as well as nerve wracking to join. And it's flown by. I mean, this is my fourth season. So, and now, you know, we're welcoming new people into, into the show. So I'm no longer the new member, which is, which is nice <laughs> to be on the other side of things. Um, but yeah, and pig piggybacking off of what Jenny was saying, I've said it before, but, it just deals with such primal themes, which I think everyone can relate to, you know, new life and love and loss. And uh, I think it's just so, so wonderful to be a part of it and to celebrate the 10th series. Thank you so much. And Helen. Yeah, I mean, I can't believe it's been 10 years. I can remember the first few days, like it was yesterday, um, <clears throat> but it's been a fantastic ride, you know? Um, from not knowing if it was going to be more than six episodes to here we are 10 years later. And I think um, what's interesting is the audience that it's, it's somehow snowballed. Um, we started off with a, a strong audience, but definitely over the last 10 years, it's, it's gathered in speed. And also during lockdown, it feels as though people have discovered it for the first time. And I think what the show gives is this wonderful sense of community which perhaps we've all been longing for over the last you know, year over lockdown and even before, you know, the sense of, um, 
you know, individuals, but within a world um, where they coexist and they um, they have a community. And I think that's something that we've all been lacking and searching for and definitely something that, you know, people are looking forward to. And exactly what Jenny said, the way that Heidi has this magnificent way of reflecting what's going on in present day, especially, you know, politically um, and medically, um, the two, you know, often collide. Um, and reflecting it back to Nanata's house in the 60s and, and social history um, that was happening at the time and, and you know, making us all realise that we're sort of going around in circles slightly and things are sometimes progressing, but sometimes not. <laughs> yeah. Um, now we have, um, each of you has chosen a clip from the show. And so what I'm going to do gradually um, is introduce um, these clips and I think they will lead to part of our discussion. Um, and uh, Heidi, again, I think I'd like to turn to your clip first. And I think we'll, we'll watch this clip, which Jamie will screen for us, and then we'll have a little conversation about it afterwards so we don't spoil it. Through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the flames, you will not burn. You are precious in my eyes. This baby is still breathing. We couldn't have saved it. But to leave it alone, cold and trembling, and possibly in pain. The anaesthetic from the mother should still be in its system. It shouldn't suffer. And it cannot live. But it's living now. And it has been for an hour or more. Sister, this was the kind of way. We couldn't even tell whether it was male or female. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you, and grant you peace. What made you choose this, this clip, Heidi? Oh, firstly, I, it's, it's just one of my most memorable moments in terms of performance, and I knew Jenny wouldn't dream of choosing this herself. But thalidomide, I think, was one of our most important storylines. And it was a storyline. We first touched upon the subject towards the end of series four. Series five, we featured it in three episodes. And we have, in the subsequent series, we picked up on the story of a family whose baby had been born with thalidomide injuries. And it was an extraordinary journey to go on to follow that thalidomide story. I mean, it's I formed relationships with thalidomide survivors. I've been to... Um, the wedding of a thalidomide survivor who became a good friend and got in touch with his own story. And in fact, some personal papers, his father had kept a diary around about the time of his birth in the late 1950s. And when it became known publicly that we were going to do the thalidomide story, I think it made me realize in a way the power of Call the Midwife and also the responsibility of Call the Midwife because we were expected to do this story well by the people whose story we were telling. You know, the thalidomide community have a saying, an informal saying, nothing about us without us. And once it became known in the press that we were going to cover this story, we were contacted from many, many directions and really made a point of hearing those voices. And I think being a person who is a direct contemporary of the thalidomide generation, I found it an extraordinary, powerful and moving story simply because I'm now in my late 50s, as are the thalidomide generation, the thalidomide community. And I do remember seeing children without arms or legs at the seaside, at the swing park. People or children who were just like me and yet not at all like me. And I do realize that they played an enormous part in our 
in our society's concept of understanding disability. They were children who were visibly disabled. They, 50% of them were reared at home by their families. And because there was someone to blame, because there was a scandal, I think people were encouraged to respond to those children with a degree of compassion and inventiveness and moral imperative that perhaps disabled people hadn't experienced in the past. I think they've done a lot for um, disability perception, not least because of their enormous achievements in, in every professional and personal field. But it was just such an important story for us to tell. And that baby on the draining board was a moment that cannot be forgotten because it happened again and again. And there is film and archive evidence of medical professionals who saw this happen. It's not something that happens today in the Western world, but I felt it was a, a very profound aspect of a story that we were engaged in telling in as detailed a way as possible. And I do think the work of the director of that episode, the work of the, the makeup department in creating that tragic prosthetic, we call it the poorly baby, um, our sort of more active prosthetic we know as baby Susan. And there is something, I, I know the actors will have found this and Jenny obviously handled that prosthetic. There's something extraordinarily moving about seeing a baby that was born like that. And yet, because we are a popular drama, we could not only reach a large audience with this story and create conversations and provoke memory, but we were able to do something, no subsequent documentary, and there have been fantastic documentaries and indeed a very good drama called On Giant Shoulders that was made in the late 70s. We were able to go behind the delivery room door and indeed behind the sluice room door. And that was a privilege and a responsibility that I didn't want to shirk. And to me, that links to the larger question of the remarkable way in which Call the Midwife has dealt with disability. And seeing you, Jenny, in that clip also makes me think of how that work has reached out into the real world. And, I, and before I ask you for your clip, mm -hmm. Jenny, you know, because I know you've become involved um, or you, you are involved um, uh, with raising awareness of cystic fibrosis. And that has played a part in the show. And I'm interested to know how your work in the show and your work in the world come together in that way. That is very particular because um, cystic fibrosis affects my family. I'm a carrier, like one in 25 people. Um, it doesn't affect me. Um, my brother was, and he married someone who was, and my niece has cystic fibrosis. And I was aware that in um, 1960, it was possible to test, I think it was six, 59 or 60, it was possible to test for the first time whether um, cystic fibrosis was, uh, uh, whether someone actually had cystic fibrosis. So um, I, put forward a proposition to Heidi, because I know that she, there's a lot of research goes on and she loves using medical, the history, the history what's happening to, to, to bring it up to date. So I just threw this. And of course she developed a wonderful story about a family with cystic fibrosis. It was something I could recognize. Um, and it was, it was wonderful for, um, for the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. I think that after the episode was shown, it had more hits on the website than it had ever had. So it brings awareness. and. And that is wonderful with the programme, and it's done that with a lot of things. I must say something about the thalidomide story that I loved as well, because that, that thing of loss and birth, and, and, and one says that, you know, child is born and, and there is great hope. And in this case, there isn't, which is why it's so desperately sad. Um, but that little circle went all the way around to Sheila having her baby. And that same blessing that she gives, she's able to give to Sheila's baby, because it's, you know, there's a little ceremony as this baby arrives and one just is rem remembering a loss and then a possibility and and that's what one lives with all the time and jenny um why don't we see uh jenny has chosen a clip and so i think we will bring that one up now and then we will discuss it afterwards so can we see jenny's clip
never done that before. Oh, I have. When you were very, very tiny. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's it's so oh, mind your eye, line it does. Oh, oh, oh. It, oh. It's such a simple oh. moment, and that's what mm. extraordinary Heidi always finds something which you perhaps wouldn't think about and throws it in there. And this is mm. a way of of showing, um, you know, her mother is dying, and and that moment of just taking care of her. her giving her a manicure gives them the moment to be together. Mm. And it's, you know, that, that is the one regret that one has in life is if you don't manage to connect with a parent um, mm. and haven't done through your life. And, it, you know, you look at that and it's just, it's, mm. it's just beautifully, I mean, it's also, we have wonderful guest artists and Cheryl Campbell was fantastic. And of course, Miranda is, is, is terrific. So it's, it's just beautiful. And I just find it very touching. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 I, I was <laughs> go ahead Heidi no no uh, it was exactly as Jenny said there's a there's a sort of scene earlier Chemi's had an awful relationship with her mother and it moved from being comedic at the end of series one when we first met her mother to to being more serious but um Chemi actually says of her mother when she's faced with caring for her as she becomes terminally ill I can't touch her and the way they played that scene was so beautiful because how can you give someone a manicure and not touch them and not literally feel their pulse as it's fading? And, um, but I haven't seen that clip for years and it did make me cry, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think one of the things that's so remarkable about Call the Midwife um, is it's a book about the spirit, but also, of course, it's a book, it's a book, it's a, it's a show about the spirit, but it's also about embodiment and this to me is a wonderful um as jenny was saying picking out this this moment of small physical connection that means so much and there are so many moments like this in call the midwife and there it also seems to me it's a show about agency about people and perhaps and particularly women taking responsibility for their own lives and of course the lives of other people the lives of the people they care for as i said in my little introduction and this leads me um to helen's clip um that uh we'd like to see next um and and discuss so if jamie could tee up um helen's choice and we'll look at that and then have a little conversation Gentlemen, every year you publish a health report that runs to 80 or more pages, delineating every birth, every death, every epidemic, every case of notifiable illness in this borough. But it is all numerical information. No one is ever named. Nevertheless, since the end of the First World War, the Order of St. Raymond Nonatus has helped 117 women called Mary, 30 women called Agnes, 83 women called Rose or Roseanne or Rosemary. There have been dozens of Ediths and the list of surnames invokes the globe. Jones, Walker, Cohen, Zhang, Patel, O'Connor, Christopolis, Adwa, Singh, Smith, there will always be Smiths. And every name in these ledgers represents a life entire. There are bus drivers and warehouse men and teachers at work in the East End today because a Nanata's midwife knew how to unravel an umbilical cord from around a newborn's neck or clear an airway of meconium to stop a child choking. We know this because their mothers wrote to us. I suggest you read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest.
We know because their names are in our records. Babies are not statistics at Nanata's house. We know when they are wanted or unwanted, whether they are cherished or deprived. We see when they're in with a chance in life or stand no chance at all. We value every infant and every mother equally. We are part of their world and they are part of ours because that is what happens when you enter people's homes. In almost 30 years of annual reports, you have never once mentioned the contribution Nonata's house has made to people's lives in Poplar. You have never once called us by our name. But do not think we won't be missed if you wipe us out completely. Remind us, Helen, of the context of that scene, which I believe is from series nine, um, and, and, and why it is you chose it. Um, it's really when the Nazis has to fight for their uh, uh, ability to, to remain as part of the community, as such a pillar for the community um, in terms of midwifery and, and community nursing. Um, and uh, the we the mothers and the patients who we we've taught within Poplar and the surrounding area write these beautiful letters, which we um, we present and um, you know and and it felt like a really relevant clip because it's less about Trixie; she's merely the deliverer. It's really about the whole sense of an artist and the whole sense of nursing, really, and how. Um, how it seems so relevant today to list those names in the way that on the anniversary of um, COVID, of course, those names were listed in exactly the same way. And it, feel, you know, it's that wonderful way that Heidi has to reflect with, you know, this was filmed way before as well, but she has this sort of sixth sense to be able to predict almost. Um, and here we are, you know, all these years later with a similar sort of fight going on. And it felt like the most sort of um, resonating clip for myself. And I think one of the things that strikes me about watching this clip right now, as you say, in what is still um, not the end of this terrible pandemic that has been going on for a year now, is the importance of community, of the, of the smaller groups, not the big national government, the test and trace that perhaps hasn't worked as well <laughs> as anyone thought it would, when people could have turned to smaller groups of community that know how their communities function. And I wonder, Helen, if that's something you've thought about in the course of the show. Um, absolutely. And I think definitely over the last year, the fact that with the initial lockdown, there was the volunteer search, which the government did set up, I think, um, to, to enlist people's help to deliver groceries or whatever, or medical supplies to neighbours and people who may be in need. And it is that sense of community that we've lost. And, and, and perhaps there's a sense of grasping it back over the last year. But it's, you know, the symbolic nature of, of that unity of nurses and that mass of of NHS care workers sat opposite a bench of, you know, suited men. And it sort of feels a relevant um, parallel, I suppose, to government and, and the NHS at the moment. And, and here we are last week with the, um, you know, the care workers um, overnight allowance and things like that. So it's, it's an ongoing conversation, which I don't think has, has, has had an end to it since the beginning of you know, um, Clement Sattley starting the NHS all those years ago. It's a constant conversation that's evolving and 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 treading water slightly. Mm. Yes. One of the things, sorry. No, no, what I was going to say to reinforce what Helen has said is I think there is something very potent about acknowledgement. And um, there was a line in Trixie's address where she says, you, you know, 30 years of health reports, you have never mentioned the contribution that Nanata's house has made. And that's actually true. I read all these health reports. It's the basis of my medical research for each series. Every year within London, there was a report published by the Medical Officer for Health. And it goes into statistics involving death, disease, epidemics, etc. And although it would always have very copious statistics about maternity care, stillbirth, neonatal difficulties and illnesses, it never mentioned 
the community of St. John the Divine who are providing those services. And I find mm. that absolutely extraordinary. And, um, but I deliberately put it into that episode because I think in about 1967, they get a mention. And because basically the GLC are trying to close them down by cutting off their funding. And you just think, how hard do people have to fight to be acknowledged? So often acknowledgement comes on a very personal scale because we ourselves have perhaps received help from district nurses or, or the GP or whatever. And it does make me want to shout and bang a drum. And in a way, I think that is what Call the Midwife does. It says this care is provided for the many by the few and the few put so much of themselves into it personally mm -hmm. and sometimes they have to make choices at great personal cost you know it's I think our nurses and our caregivers are just extraordinary I have a number of nurses in my own family and when you see the toll the pandemic has taken on them on their mental and indeed physical health I, I cannot believe they're not getting more acknowledgement and more governmental support and indeed more money um you know, which, which of course comes into it too. Um, <clears throat> the enemy, um, we have one uh, final clip um, to watch. And uh, I think again, this, this raises a subject that we've already had a, a question about, um, which is about the range um, of ages of women that we see in Call the Midwife. <clears throat> so let's have Leonie's clip now. Was it my fault? Do you think if she'd stayed in her own home? We do not choose the time of our passing. He does. I hate to think of her dying in a nursing home on her own. She had friends around her, but had not yet had time to make their acquaintance. Friends are everywhere, if one has the eyes to see them. <laughs> I don't mind if I do. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Tell us why you chose this clip, Leonie. <sighs> <laughs> I chose this scene um, for so many reasons. It was one of my favourite storylines working with Annette Crosby. Annette Crosby plays Miss Milgrove. And you get to see Lucille in a, a different capacity, not a midwife, more of a nurse. And she, Annette Crosby was just such a generous actress. And uh, we discover that she's a hoarder and she's agoraphobic. And it just, it was a storyline that really touched me. And it was, the scene I had with, with Judy was just, I, I, Lucille had become a friend to Miss Milgrove and it felt that Sister Monica Joan then became a friend to me um, because Lucille was in need and I think it just speaks to uh, you know the nature of our show and just having so many generations and also for me Caribbean culture is very much about respecting your elders and having a good relationship with them and it felt that Sister Monica Joan for me became like you know a, a mother a grandmother in that moment and I'm very aware that Lucille doesn't have any family uh, in the UK. So that to me was just such a special moment. But we see her, one of the feelings that I have um, about her is the way that she tries to make her own family, um, both through church and also through her romantic life. How important has it been to you, Leonie, bringing that, you know, thinking the, the time of Windrush after the war in the United Kingdom. How important has it been to you bringing that aspect of Black British life into the show? Yeah, it, it's important. And I think another one of my favourite moments is when Lucille 
finds uh, her church. And uh, it's a very special moment because it was true to my family's story. And uh, it was an experience that my granddad had. And a lot of my mum's cousins, I found out uh, because of this, that they were christened uh, in living rooms and uh, they would have services in the living room. So it was a special story for so many reasons. And I think it's important for anyone to find their community, but it just felt extra special because it spoke to, you know, how my family found their community when they came to England. Thank you very much. And as I said, um, in thinking about that clip, and as Leonie said, um, we see Sister Micah Joan. Um, we have both ends of the kind of age spectrum there. And we have a question from our audience for Heidi um, <clears throat> from Kelly. The show gives older female actors a platform where lots of shows don't. How important is it to you, Heidi, to showcase a broad range of ages of women? I do it as naturally as breathing, partly because I am myself quite old. You know, there's no great policy decision here. I'm 58. I was 48 when I started writing the show and I have always had intergenerational friendships. I've got friends much younger than myself. I have a, a very dear friend who is almost 90. In fact, she's over 90 now. And I just find drama is about texture. And yes, we have always had core group of younger or young women at the heart of the show but equally the wisdom of our older characters is very very important but the, it does it's very female driven I think therefore you do get a lot of texture in intergenerational relationships you know if they you know they can come they do all sorts of important busy you know grafting gritty work out in the community but then they can come home to Nanata's house have sardines on toast and talk about tights and are they going to wear tights instead of stockings? Because I can remember my mother debating that for about three years in the 1960s. It was one of the first <laughs> adult conversations I overheard were, were the, you know, the hosiery conversation. And um, I have always found women incredibly fascinating. As a child, I was an eavesdropper. And I ha now have friendships that have survived for decades and make new friends as well with each year that passes. So I don't set out to create work opportunities for actors of any age or gender. What I set out to do is make people passionately visible and to represent human company, human community in all its richness and variety. And, um, you know, we do have roles for older men on the show as well, uh, as well as younger ones. And I think as the 60s unfold, we are telling more male centric storylines, which Again, I think it richens and deepens the communication between our characters and it opens the door to more stories. But um, I just love writing for women of my old age and older because wisdom lies there, humour lies there, experience lies there. There's a lot to reflect upon and a lot to forge ahead with. You know, Nurse Crane is an older woman, but she's always game for an adventure. Um, when they have a sweepstake for the World Cup, she says, well, I think we should be in the swim, you know, and she gets her little flag and things because being old isn't about being static or stationary. It's about appreciating the context you've created for yourself throughout your life. And that's it really. Um <laughs> we um we have a, a question um which touches on something I was going to ask. Um and I, I will go kind of around the room as it were on this one. Um Andrea asks, um uh, Call the Midwife touches on many subjects that could be described as taboo or sensitive as the series moves forward in time. Is there a topic or subject <clears throat> that Heidi or any of the panel would like to address? I had wanted to ask um Helen. Particularly, I just remember when I first started, um, when I really got into to Call the Midwife, being so struck um, by the depiction of Trixie's alcoholism um, and how sensitively and forthrightly that was done. And I wonder what that felt like for you, Helen. And then leading on to this question, I think for each of you, of whether there are subjects that you would like Call the Midwife to address. So I'll turn to Helen first. Um, it was a really interesting subject that Heidi um, first spoke to me about and it was something you know the penny just dropped when they said um, 
when Heidi and Pippa said to me, you know, we're going to look at Trix's drinking. And, you know, it's almost in that moment that I could imagine people who suffer with drinking problems have that sort of dawning moment of, oh God, of course, there is a problem. And she definitely faces up to that and, you know, and we're still dealing with that. It hasn't gone away, it's a constant. And I think having the ability to have a constant battle um, in, in healthy ways or, you know, when she's really struggling it, with this is really interesting. And I think also adding to the medical professionals, profession side of it. So addiction within the medical profession, um, dealing with all of the stresses, pers personal and professional as well, um, is a really important subject. And it's been a fantastic um, challenge, really, to, to be able to develop and and Trixie has this wonderful aid of being go, going back to the AA meeting so you can always sort of check in with her how she's doing as a character and Heidi's been so fantastic technically and using those and written them so beautifully um, so it's been a fantastic storyline to to live with through these years um, and oh gosh what stories um, in the future I, I um I I you know I leave that to Heidi, happy to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know what I'm planning. <laughs> I suppose, Leonie, you know, turning to you, one of the things I'm very struck by is, again, and, and this, in a sense, all of these questions, because Heidi is, uh, is, writing, is writing the show, but I'm thinking about what it feels like to you. And I think one of the things that, um, um, with your character is the issue which seems like a very modern issue but of I want to say work-life balance mm. um because she's trying to maintain a relationship and that's that's a struggle it's always a struggle her relationship with her faith and her relationship with what's going on around her you're talking about yes yes indeed and with and with her with her love life um and so how you be a working woman um Leonie and how you have um, and how you maintain a, a romantic relationship. I wonder, Leonie, if that's something that that's significant to you as an issue. Uh, I wouldn't say an issue. I mean, you see her, you see Lucille balance that more in season 10, uh, the season that, you know, we're, we're about to show now. Um, I mean, you're right. I suppose it's always difficult to balance you know, your romantic relationship and, and work relationship. But I think the struggle for me, I'm not sure what Heidi thinks, but probably more her faith with working life because Lucille's grown up in such a, a rural uh, part of Jamaica and uh, probably been quite, you know, closeted to, to a certain extent. So coming to London is such, um, is such a shock to the system. And, you know, you've got people like Trixie and we had Val who are quite, progressive in their thinking and Lucille at the beginning was very traditional and uh, had her her thoughts on um, you know how women should behave and so but she's definitely changed now as the series have gone on uh, which which I like because I think that they've been a positive influence on Lucille in that sense uh, but I definitely think yeah probably her faith and and work life is probably a harder balance. We'll say Cyril is quite understanding. <laughs> he is quite understanding. He is quite understanding. He's quite a honey, I have to say. I'm very fond of him. Oh. Um, but that but that relationship of faith and you know when I think Jenny um, about the way that uh, Sister Julienne um, dealt with the introduction of the pill, that's a very interesting moment um, well, in the show. Yes. Because you, you started off this conversation talking about um, uh, the, the women's development and, and things. And of course, as women become more in control of their lives, which has been happening through that decade from the beginning of the 60s. Um, yes, Julian has to deal with that. I have to say, I thought your question was about Sister Julian's work. Um, <laughs> relationship. <laughs> yes, I guess the, the, the is, there is the balance between what she does and her faith. Um, so that is there. Yes, and, and one has to remember as well, the thing about being that much older is not, is, is about your own experience. And she's been through the First and Second World War. Um, she's lived a different kind of life to Trix's life, which is, a, you know, coming into the 60s, everything's much more open. So she's battling with, with the view of, of, of what relationships are, what, what they meant to her as a young woman earlier. 
um, and also her religious beliefs. Um, so with the pill, she very much, and with the birth control and with abortion, she is a woman who wants to look after other women. And she sees the necessity of that and where it lies. It's just how all of those things are used. She wants that sort of to be in, the, in, a, in, a, in a place that is about family and is, that does sit more comfortably with her religion. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it, it is something that she has to ask constantly, the questions about the changes, the changes medically, the changes that happen in society, what that means, what that means morally, how that affects and how that affects the world that they're in. And Heidi, you referred earlier to the research that you do. Of course, you do a great deal of research when you were talking about looking at these documents um, where the name wasn't used of, of the model for, for Nanata's house. And without giving anything away about what might come in future series, I wonder if you can tell us how in doing your research you find the issues that are going to come into the shows as they as they go along. It's interesting. One of the things, <clears throat> listening to the girls talking about character development and work, you know, everything from work life balance to faith work balance. What I really, what I have realised over the past ten years is a show which has longevity is able to tell stories about change in a very realistic way. We have the luxury of a slow burn. That might be Lucille's romance with Cyril. It might be Trixie's alcoholism. Like many people who struggle with addiction, she's had peaks and troughs and periods of stability. We don't, we deal in drama, not melodrama. So everything has to be earned. And what I tend to do is go and look in the first instance at the driest resources that are available to me. That will be um, the Office of the Health Reports at the Wellcome Trust. I also read Hansard or certainly cross check things with Hansard and I go through the British newspaper archive. <clears throat> and I'm not looking for issues, I'm looking for stories. And for me, a story is something that grabs you in the heart or the throat or the stomach, not the brain. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's something that surprises me, something that angers me, something that will make me weep or simply illuminate me, educate me on something I did not know. And once I have been grabbed by a story, I look at ways for fleshing it out. I do, I do more research and we all, by the time we get to script stage, we consult with experts on any medical story. And I think what it is for me is the way in which stories can unfold. For example, we showed Trixie training as a cervical cytology nurse because cervical smear testing was being introduced on a voluntary and experimental level via GP practices. And as we go forward into say series 11, I, I would like to tell a story where cervical cancer is diagnosed. We haven't done that yet, for example, but we've set the seeds for that almost two years ago. So it's <clears throat> there is an element of allowing the social and medical landscape to unfold at a realistic pace, which I really, really enjoy. And one story will obviously, you know, just quite naturally lead on to another story. So it's about development and continuity as much as anything else. And we've done a lot about vaccination in the past. And now, for example, we don't tell stories about polio anymore because people have been vaccinated against it. We might tell a story in the future about a young woman who was disabled by polio, for example, who is now having a baby. And what does that mean for her as someone who has limited movement of her lower limbs, for example, and has to face up to society's prejudice. So that's a different aspect of the polio story. The world just seems to get richer as we go further along. And I do think we are now seeing women attain agency over their own bodies. What I would, what I like to think is as we go forward in time, perhaps women will start enjoying their own bodies, um, which is something we haven't really seen them do yet. They live in mortal fear of anything that might lead to pregnancy. Uh, <clears throat> that, you know, we've seen women incontinent through childbirth injury on two occasions. It's like, do you know, I'm really looking forward to the bit of the 60s where women actually start to have some fun because then I think we really are going to break out of the doll's house and our bodies won't be an object, an unruly object that has to be dominated and controlled, but something that can be 
celebrated and enjoyed. And I think later in the 60s, one does see that in popular movements of feminism. And we have said the V word, vagina, so many times now. People are still shocked. But we have yet to say the F word, which is feminism, because we see the women in Nanata's house living lives of extraordinary autonomy. <clears throat> They're very professionally dedicated, first of all. Their work comes first. But the word feminism has never been used because it hasn't really been coined at this point, certainly not for popular usage. So, you know, if we do continue for a couple more years, I think we might be getting into that sort of territory. And I always loved the way Jenny delivered the line when Sister Julianne expressed concerns about the pill because she didn't want it to facilitate <laughs> recreational intercourse, which she felt recreational intercourse was not the way to go. Um, but of course, that's the way the world is going. So it will be interesting to see the team dealing with that as we go further down the line. That's a very interesting description of the way that in the course of the 10 years, women's bodies have, mm. the way that they have viewed their own bodies has changed from just these unruly objects to having agency over them, and then perhaps moving towards enjoyment. But some of these difficult storylines, and I like this, um, I like this question, we have an, an anonymous question. Um, Call the Midwife deals with some heavy, difficult storylines. Um, and this questioner wants to ask, how do the cast support each other when filming these? I think those of us who are kind of outside of the of of the television industry watching these scenes, there are these very challenging moments. And I wonder what it's like. I might turn to you, um, Leonie, first, what it's like to be in this with this group of of people, your fellow performers and writers. Yeah, I think when you speak of that, the storylines that come to mind are the storylines um, where we're dealing with racism because they're personally quite difficult to film. And um, yeah, the cast in that situation are very, very supportive. And uh, yeah, some cast members, this is not uh, regular cast members, but uh, some of our guest stars have apologized after takes. I mean, and we know it, it, it's acting, but just they've taken their support to even a further level by, you know, apologizing afterwards. Um, but yeah, I think it's in those sort of situations, it's always nice to have a very calm set and just have actors that are very supportive. And I mean, to apologize afterwards, of course they don't have to, but the fact that they do is just, uh, yeah, it, it just makes you feel a lot more comfortable and supported by everyone. How about you, Helen? I think <clears throat> that's one of the strong points of the show. There's always been a sense of support, a strong sense of support and um, and I think for a while it was seen that women on TV could couldn't survive without having some sort of sort of cat fight or something. And here we are, living proof that it you know women can live with women and it can be a supportive environment and um, and an environment which um, you know gives you growth and and um, and so much variety and and light and love in your life. Um, and I think that's true on our set as well I know lots of people that have been coming on as guest artists have also said you know it's just such a lovely set to come on to everybody's so supportive and that goes across you know the um, crew as well and a lot of the crew we've had since the beginning so there is a strong sense of support um, on and off the camera which is wonderful and and one of my favorite things about the job I have to say. Jenny. Uh, I think that it's interesting, I think, about support, because you're often not around the person within a storyline that um, might need support. But I, but I do, I'm very, very aware that, that one's there to give huge encouragement when you're, when you're working on something, to, to allow people to, to delve into whatever difficulties they might be going through, um, whether they're personal ones or it, there's something that comes out of the story that will touch them. You're there, to, you know, you, you very much want to support what they're doing. Um, and and allow them the space to do it, allow them the, the assurance that, you know, that the direction they're going, and just, just to be there, you know, just to, to let, them, let, them, let them do it and let them know that they're, that they're surrounded by people that care. Can I just add to that as well? Um, you know, when we started the show, I was 
younger, 10 years younger. And mm -hmm. we were surrounded by, you know, Jenny and Judy and Pam and these wonderful actresses that had so much experience. And I think that's what's been so wonderful. There's been such a lot of respect, mutual respect between the ages. And, um, and you know, Jenny and Judy have, because they're still on the show, have been so encouraging over the years and, you know, really excited by all of the younger's, um, younger actors' um, growth um, within the, the craft of, of acting. It's been um, really lovely to be on the receiving end of, of that experience being passed on and that support from, you know, grassroots up. And Heidi, um, well, I should say also we're coming, uh, we're coming almost um, to the end of our time. So we're about to close. Um, but I'll ask you, Heidi, that, you know, talking to you as I have now over the years, um, talking to Pippa, to, to Annie Tricklebank, um, how important has it been to create this supportive atmosphere? Oh, I think it makes a world of difference. I mean, just for me as a writer, um, uh, there's a phrase I often use, which is the loneliness of the long distance writer. I do do most of my work in isolation. You know, I went into the pandemic thinking, oh, this is a piece of cake. I sit in the house on my own all the time anyway. And like everybody else, I think I found it a strain over time. But I think as a writer, you have to be brave. You use your imagination and you put your innermost thoughts out there. And I know within Call the Midwife, there has never been a story too bold or too dark or just too out there for me to pitch. And so I kind of know I'm guaranteed a soft landing place for some very hard ideas. And I can't tell you how freeing that is and how that has enabled me to sort of spread my creative wings because I know I'm never going to get laughed out of the room or told something is impossible or, told no that story is too dark um and I suppose what Paul my wife has given me which not every writer can say they get in their career is a home I have a home on that show um and a home is a very precious place a home is where you are safe a home is where you can do bold things and I like to think that some of the courage we exhibit as a drama comes about because we have tremendous trust between ourselves and when you have a company like ours, there's no way you're scared to go. I think that's a wonderful note um, to end on, I have to say. And I would echo that in saying I know that that's what I feel as a viewer. And I know that's what millions and millions of viewers feel, that they have a home when they come to the show. And that if you are in a safe home, there's nothing that you can't deal with or talk about. There's nothing that's too difficult. And I think Call the Midwife proves that to all of us. And I've loved being here with Leonie and Helen and Jenny and Heidi um, for this 10th anniversary celebration. Thank you to our panelists um, and long live Call the Midwife. Thank you all. <laughs>